So this evening I'm going to discuss taking responsibility for the solar system on sort of an update of a class I gave a while ago on the from desert to garden, Los Angeles and the newosphere. And you may or may not know that today is World Water Day as declared by the United Nations on their, the last day of their forum on water held in Mexico City. And according to their report, which I looked at briefly this morning, everyone on the planet needs about 20 to 50 liters of clean water daily. One-sixth of the world population is still without adequate water. Two-fifths of the world population is without sanitation. And this, there is a shocking number of deaths, primarily children, from preventable diseases caused by the lack of clean water. Over 5,400 people are estimated to die every day from diarrheal diseases. In 2001, the World Health Organization estimated that two, there were 2 million deaths that year, 1.4 million of them children. Malaria kills 1 million people a year. Now, the UN goal of this forum is to reduce the amount of lack of water, that is to increase the amount of available clean water by 50 percent by the year 2015. But looking at the solutions they pose, though there are a few good ideas, they will fail. And they'll not just fail because the, uh, the, uh, the uh, proposals are bad, but the United Nations won't be able to do it because it is only nation states who can actually carry out the necessary programs to accomplish this task beginning with the United States. So the need for LaRouche's International Economic Recovery and Development Program highlighting nuclear power development uh, being led by the United States has to be implemented immediately. Now looking at the current administration's policy on water management, the point is abundantly obvious if you look at the next slide. <laughs> Witness Karina. Or, <clears throat> and out to lunch. LaRouche has a different view of fission than George W. It involves nuclear materials. <laughs> now, I want to go back a little bit and... Uh, looking at LaRouche's paper on science and infrastructure, where he uh, states that the principles of physical economics witnessed by the American system provide proof that, quote, the only source of actual profit of economy as a whole is the application of discovered universal physical principles to the effect of creating new states of nature, states of nature which could not have existed prior to making those discoveries of what are provable universal physical principles. The proof must be physical, not mathematical. The typical effect of such policies of science-driven practice is to increase what I have defined as the potential relative population density of society as measurable per capita and per square kilometer of the Earth's surface." Unquote. Now, the ideas are of two natures. One is that followed by Plato and his followers, the ideas concerning nature, that is, the individual discovery of the principle of abiotic physics or biological. And number two, the discovery of social principles bearing upon mankind's increased power to acquire and cooperate in realizing realization of those ideas. This is the physical proof that the human individual is superior to Felix Rohatton, I, I'm, of an animal, that is, i.e., that the individual's ability to generate discovery and transmit it breaks the biological limits of, 
of so-called fixed resources or fixed limit of relative potential population density. You either progress or you die. There is no middle ground. The, now, the economist versus the accountant. Question, what was the actual net cost of construction of the transcontinental railroad system of the United States? Or for that matter, the, matter, the U.S. Apollo program that put a man on the moon. The cost is precisely the number of universal principal ideas that have gone through the head of George W. Bush. Zero. <laughs> that is, when you look at what it costs in terms of dollars, which is really a political question, not a physical question, and the resulting productivity because we undertook that project, such as the Transcontinental Railroad or the Apollo Project, resulted in a manifold increase in actual physical production and real wealth being generated. For every, and we can quote David Rockefeller's bank on that one, uh, <coughs> which did a, a study on the Apollo Project, and they found out that for every dollar spent by the U.S. government generated $14 in the private sector because of whole new spin-offs of technologies resulting from that crash program. Now, looking at the infrastructure uh, of our nation, for example, as LaRouche has pointed out, uh, the mass transit system is like the bloodstream. It also transmits ideas. And through the U.S. development of its canals, our highways, the river uh, improvements, air transport, we not only transported things, we transported people, and more importantly, in effect, ideas. That is the American system. That is the Roosevelt model, such as the Rural Electrification Program. The National Railway Grid is like a living tissue. It has an interactive and cognitive powers used by the people who developed it and use it. Now, infrastructure is the life support system for the planet, and not only for humans. If you can look at the next slide, please, we see the ideas that uh, LaRouche has developed from Vladimir Vernotsky, a great Russian scientist, regarding the biosphere and the newosphere. He is the founder of uh, biogeochemistry. And examining the human activity of the biosphere, Vernotsky defined a universal physical principle which he called noesis. Noesis, LaRouche said, is a class of mental activity which generates the discovery of those hypotheses which qualify experimentally as universal physical principles, unquote. So you have the biosphere, which is life taking over regions of the planet, and you have the newosphere where noesis is exhibiting, in fact, the longer run, a superior quality of mere living existence. And as the planet evolves, three mutually distinctive categories of action are constantly transforming the planet, interacting with each other, the abiotic, the living or biological, and the cognitive, or noesis. As man's impact on natural resources has become relatively large, we must now begin giving a helping hand to the abiotic and the living processes. They need our help. And in order to improve the average living conditions of humanity with a growing population. In order to do that, we have to make the deserts bloom. Now this next slide I want to show, I want you to guess where this is. Some of you may have been at the first class I gave, may know. But I'll give you a hint. It's in the solar system. No, it's not Dinuba. <laughs> Mars. Mars. That's Mars. No, it's not Mars. <laughs> that is the California desert out near Cadiz, and we'll talk about that in a bit. If you go to the next slide, that's Mars. That's from the 1976 uh, Viking landing craft. 
that uh, transmitted this back to JPL over in Pasadena. And if you have the time and opportunity, you can go through the whole catalog of pictures uh, if you go over there. Now, we have a certain extraterrestrial uh, imperative. And that includes certain conditions that may affect our planet, like asteroids colliding with it. The colonization of Mars is a necessary step, not only just to avoid having the human race wiped out and the planet destroyed by asteroids, but it is our job. In fact, to take responsibility, not just for this planet, and I don't mean responsibility in the way some greenie talks about it, where they talk about we have to take responsibility for the environment and then proceed to denounce human beings for destroying the, human, uh, the environment and offer nothing <laughs> as a solution to the problem, except that people are evil. Get rid of them as soon as you can. No, there has to be a... In order to look and understand our own history, we have to look, and, and actually to solve these problems, you have to look at the history of the abiotic and the living on this planet and its atmosphere. You also have to look at the history of noesis and how it's relative to the, the uh, former. And looking at both, you can get a consubstantiality of action to take. Now, we can take a, a case example of California and specifically Los Angeles. You go to the next slide. The red dot is our office. <laughs> It's a uh, NASA, probably a Landsat satellite photo. Now, there's a popular axiom in our culture today which states that man destroys nature, right? That's sort of a given, right? Uh, the question, is there more non-human life here in the city of Los Angeles now than before the mass invasions of the human beings following the gold rush of 1849. Yes. Is there more non-human life in the city limits of Los Angeles now or 150 years ago? It's questionable whether it helps the, uh, the abiotic or living processes. <laughs> a little slow in the back room. Okay. Well, the answer obviously is no. There was not more life more than 150 years ago. You go to the next slide. This is a shot of a family living in the beautiful San Fernando Valley in 1848. And any vegetation you might see growing has been planted there by those people. And what you see is a whole lot of nothing. No vegetation. <coughs> there is a cow, a few horses. And that's it. So, in fact, there is more non-human life in the city limits of Los Angeles since human beings arrived. In fact, not only is there more life, more species have been created because of us, like the Hollywood finch. Right? Or the California lilac and so on. Now, looking at California in the beginning, if you go to the next slide. This is a snapshot of the um, Cretaceous period about 145 to 95 million years ago. And you can see the green spots here are the land masses, Australia and Antarctica, close cousins, and the tectonic plates here. And this is North America and California over here, underwater. Go to the next slide. You can see the shot of the, here's the Sierra 
mountains range here. And you have the interior of the United States, so-called Middle America, is underwater along with a good chunk of Mexico, and the west coast, the Pacific coast, also underwater. You go to the next slide. No, don't go to the next slide. You've got, uh, you had a, the first humans arriving, we're not sure when. There's evidence that the Irish were here. <laughs> I'm serious. There's Ogam stone that was found up in Altadena, uh, <coughs> along with probably water and land emigration from Asia. But the first European uh, mission, literally, came with Junipero Serra, the uh, Dominican uh, padre who was deployed during the American Revolution by uh, Carlos III and uh, Galva to come north from Mexico to colonize California, Upper California, in 1776, actually part of the Spanish flank against the British Empire in support of the American Revolution. So you had an Indian population here at that time. I'm not going to go through a lot of that, but you did have the first irrigation project in Los Angeles County in San Gabriel where they actually had clay pipes that were used to bring water from the San Gabriel River to the mission where we had our first vineyard and other food. So, as I pointed out, I've, I wrote a paper back in 2001 that's available now on the website, which goes through a lot of the history, which I'll mention today, but not go through a lot of detail, and that's available. And it goes through particularly the period beginning with the, just prior to California coming into the Union, 1830s, 40s. We actually came into the Union in 1850. And the threat by the British, in particular, to carve out the west coast of the, what is now the United States as a British protectorate or part of their empire. Uh, and this continued, and still does, uh, by the British oligarch. Uh, and it, the paper actually goes through the, the uh, focusing on John Gately Downey in particular, who is the man who kept us in the Union during the Civil War and is the man most responsible for building Los Angeles out of this desert that we now live in. So <clears throat> that's that'll be available. So I'm not going to go through a lot of detail. You can read that on your own. But I am going to reference some of these things because the British threat, which you don't read about in any modern history books. Some people wrote about it in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but since at least 1839, uh, the British, including this guy Alexander Forbes, who was the British consul down in Mexico, and his nephew up in uh, Santa Clara, uh, had offered the Mexican government $50 million to relieve their debt payments, that is the Barings Bank out of London, that Mexico could relieve their debt, they would write it off if they would just give the British Empire Upper California. Well, thank God that Mexicans didn't go for that deal. This is much like the IMF and the World Bank policies currently. Uh, so in 1918, rather, in 1849, you had the big gold rush, the big emigration. Because what was needed in California, which was became quite known to uh, Junipero Serra and the, the Padres who set up the missions here, is there was, there was a profound lack of people. There were Indians but not a lot of them, frankly. And the best way to get people out here, and this was a strategic flank for the, for the United States as well, the gold rush served that purpose. It was actually, gold was discovered at, quote, Sutter's Mill in 1848, and it was Lieutenant William Tecumseh Sherman, who later became a, a very important general in the Civil War, who drafted the letter along with General Mason up in Monterey that, uh, verified this discovery and sent back the communique to Washington. So in 1846, the population in California, and I, I, there's conflicting figures of this, somewhere 9,000, maybe 20,000, I'm not sure, 900 foreigners, somewhere in that neighborhood. In 1852, there were over 264,000 people in California. 
Many of them came here on the get-rich-quick idea of finding gold in the mountains of California. Now, there was a constitutional convention for California held in Monterey in 1849, in September of that year, uh, anticipating the, the uh, acceptance of California into the Union. This is hold at, held at uh, Colton Hall, which you can still go to in Monterey. And the Constitution for the state was drafted in both Spanish and English. And in fact, all of the legislature uh, up until 1877 was done bilingually. Um, and there was one particular clause put into the Constitution of this state that was a real stuck in the craw of those who did not want California to be free, that wanted it to be a slave state. And that is because William Shannon, an Irishman of 27 years old, was responsible for putting the anti-slavery clause into the California Constitution. This drove the pro-slave people a little crazy. They kept trying to go around it for many years. Uh, so California did join the Union, 1850. If you go to the next slide now, it can, this, uh, what ensued with California becoming a state was a real battle led by these two gentlemen, really, on opposing sides. One is this guy, Senator Actually, he became the second senator from California when they held the first legislative meeting in Santa Clara or San Jose. And William Gwynn, this guy, and so you get a different concept of man when you contrast these two gentlemen, or one gentleman and this scumbag, uh, who, <laughs> who had a completely different idea of what man was. And Gwynn, who, who was a neighbor, uh, he's actually from Tennessee, he was a neighbor of Andrew Jackson. You all know Andrew Jackson? The Indian killing, free the land for the white man, oligarch, who, who did fight the British in the Battle of New Orleans. We'll give him that. But that was about it. Uh, he became president and then dissolved the National Bank. And when he became president and went into the White House, it was... Gwynn, William Gwynn, who went in as his personal secretary. He actually had a degree in law and medicine. That's pretty good for a guy who couldn't use his mind. And <laughs> it was typified by um, a couple of things. He actually got a uh, position handed to him, a, a gratuity for his services to Jackson to become the Marshal of Southern Mississippi which he did. He went down to Mississippi, got his own plantation, got his own slaves. He would sip on, sit on the veranda sipping mint juleps and read what? His favorite author, Sir Walter Scott. Right? This romantic, evil slime bag who romanticized the feudalist existence of the oligarchy. A liar. A trait that William Gwynn picked up. Now, and so he left, he actually ran for Congress and won, then lost re-election to another Mississippian from another state. The, all these southern, southern Confederate leaders don't even come from the states they supposedly represent. That was Jefferson Davis, who later became the president of the Confederacy. So Gwynn packed his bags and decided to go to California in hopes of becoming the first U.S. senator from the newly uh, uh, entered uh, state into the Union, California which he did. He attended the uh, convention. The first round uh, went to, uh, in, in electing the two U.S. senators from California, first went to John Fremont of the Bear Revolt fame, and then Gwynn for the longer term. Now, this, uh, I, I want to contrast that to David Broderick, whose father was asked, who was born, was, well, he was, uh, his father is from Ireland, and he was asked by an American in Ireland, he was a stonecutter, and he was asked to come to Washington, D.C. to do the decorative stonework inside the U.S. Capitol building, which he did. And Broderick grew up in New York, David Broderick. And he became 
the uh, protege of Townsend Harris. Now, you've got to understand, these guys are both Democrats, right? But they have completely opposite ideas of, of, of mankind. And Broderick, uh, under the tutelage of uh, Townsend Harris, got out of the uh, stone-cutting business and ran a political saloon, a bar in New York City, uh, a watering hole for the Democratic Party of the city. And it also gave him the time to read. Who did he read? His favorite poet, Percy Shelley. Right? And so he t ran for Congress, did not win because of corruption within the Democratic Party in New York, basically the synarchist banking interest in New York, because uh, it, so, it was a pretty mixed bag, because you had some very good Democrats in New York, like Townsend Harris, who later became the ambassador to Japan and signed the first treaty uh, between Japan and the United States, which Matoki can tell you more about if, if you'd like. So it was under Harris that uh, Broderick got his education. He decided then to come out to California, part of the gold rush, and became elected the head of the U.S., uh, or rather the, the California legislature after the convention we became a state. And there was a continual battle. This guy, Gwynn, represented a faction in the Democratic Party in California known as the Chivalry, right, uh, right out of Sir Walter Scott, uh, or sometimes appropriately called the Shiv. And <laughs> Broderick continually harassed these guys and called them Rosewater Democrats. And they continually were trying to rewrite the Constitution to allow slavery, to allow people to come into the, uh, the state from from southern states and bring their slaves with them. So there was a constant battle. And right from the beginning, what happened is that Broderick consolidated his political machine and really ran the Democratic Party in San Francisco with his boys, his uh, Irish cohorts in particular. And <clears throat> this did not go well with the plans of Gwynn, who was really the front man for the southern aristocracy in California. And there were attempts to crush the political machine of Broderick by Gwynn, uh, culminating first in 1851, the year after the first convention, after we became a state, where there was a, a uh, uh, operation set up called the Vigilance Committee, modeled on the uh, terrorist mob rule crowd of the French Revolution, of Danton and Marat, and it was denounced as such by Broderick and also Sherman, who was also in, who was a friend of Broderick's in San Francisco. Now, in fact, these guys went about their own way in trying to lynch people and so on. This is a popular notion in California history. It's even in the history books of, of the state of California, because they say, oh, it was a natural phenomena. You know, there was, there was all this crime because of all the uh, gold rush activities and lawlessness, it was a necessary evil. Same arguments that were used by Woodrow Wilson and others to justify the first Ku Klux Klan. Same thing. And these guys were vigilantes. They would go out to hang people and crush in the, in the Broderick and his political machine as the centerpiece of that operation. In fact, Broderick at one time went out with 50 of his cohorts to stop a lynch mob of thousands uh, they were outnumbered like 10 to 1, and prevented a, a lynching by just denouncing them and fighting them physically as for being the uh, immoral bastards that they were to just arbitrarily hang somebody. Now, that did not work out so well for Gwynn. So in 1822, you had another leading figure in California politics come into the state for about eight years by the name of Edward Baker. And Edward Baker was a law partner of Abraham Lincoln from Springfield, uh, Illinois. In fact, he had beat out Lincoln in, in the primary to, in the Whig Party to become elected to the Congress. But came out to California in 52. He had actually been responsible for supervising the construction of the Panama Railroad, which facilitated the time it took to get from the East Coast to the West Coast instead of going around the southern tip of Ibero-America. So he arrived on the scene, also became a quite a good friend of Broderick and, and Sherman as well. 
And uh, in 55, we basically, you have uh, I see, okay. I'm going to skip ahead to 56. A lot of this you can you can just look at my paper. There was a replay again of the vigilante committee round two. And this was much more well organized. Um, you've got um, oh, I have, why don't you go to the next slide, actually? Yeah, here's a picture of the, some of the regiments. So these guys were set up 1851 and then again in uh, 56. You go to the next slide. They'll just be hanged. There's no trial. And it was modeled, not coincidentally, on the Masonic um, principles of secrecy, the all-seeing Masonic eye is the top of their membership scroll and uh, the, the uh, membership of this committee was interchangeable with the, with the Masons and the Shiv and Broderick published the names of all the members they were supposed to be a secret society so they didn't appreciate that <laughs> but, and so they went after him they, uh, he and the, they went after scapegoats of uh, foreigners for causing the uh, supposed crime wave in San Francisco. They singled out Chileans and Australians. Now, the Australians we can all understand. <laughs> but they were the scapegoat. And in the process of this committee of vigilance, they really crushed Broderick's machine. In fact, they uh, killed a number of people. They were they put them on boats, forced them to be exiled. Broderick was literally run out of town, but amazingly came back within a, within a year uh, to uh, want, become senator of the state of California, along with Gwynn, because he had the dirt on Gwynn. So here you have two senators on opposing sides representing California. Now remember, 1857, you have the Dred Scott decision, and you have a split that occurs over the state of Kansas, whether Kansas will go slave or go with the Union, go with the North. The pro-slave faction held their own conference in Lecompton, Kansas, backed by the president, in fact. His emissary is the one who chaired the meeting. And this caused an uproar throughout the United States. So you had a, an open split within the Democratic Party. Now, here you have Broderick, on the floor of the U.S. Senate, which I want to just quote a small passage from this speech he gave, I do not intend, because I am a member of the Democratic Party, to permit the President of the United States, who has been elected to that party, to create civil war in Kansas. The only thing that has astonished me in this whole matter is the forbearance of the people of Kansas. If they had taken the delegates to the Lecompton Convention and flogged them or cut their ears off and driven them out of the country, I would have applauded the fact. So Broderick was immediately denounced by other Democrats, uh, and so, but he, he did not give an inch because this was the truth of the matter, that what was underway was a secessionist movement, treason against the United States. So what you had in California then was an open battle the convention that was held in 59, there was also a Lecompton Democratic Convention in Sacramento along with the Democratic Party Convention. And this was, this was quite a wild scene in itself. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> ah, yes, I forgot my notes. Um, oh. No, I don't have all of this. Yeah. So basically, actually, I, I skipped over the part of 56, which is important around this vigilance committee, which gets to the heart of the matter. What these guys were campaigning for is to create a Republic of the Pacific, a separate, to break off from the United States and set up their own so-called nation, probably under the protectorate of the British who were trying this kind of game for some time. And so this was their... Their, their policy. And Gwynn never said a word about this through both of these uprisings. I mentioned that we had the uh, 
the conferences in 59. You had the state elections in 59. And uh, prior to that, you had uh, a, an attempt by the same faction. They ran a thing called the American Party. And the Shiv faction refused to support the Democrats, and the American Party won, hands down and then started appointing leaders of the Shiv faction into positions of responsibility in the new state government, which included a guy named Terry, uh, David Terry, who became head of the California State Supreme Court, uh, an important guy, which we'll get to in just a second. Now, in 59, you had the state election. Well, the Compton Democrats won the governorship. Uh, this guy, Latham, got elected. The lieutenant governor from Southern California, from Los Angeles, was uh, John Downey, who was this Irishman who was not necessarily pro-slavery at all, but everyone in Los Angeles seemed to be. <laughs> so he had been elected uh, to the legislature and uh, probably some kind of, it appeared some kind of compromise and put him in the lieutenant governorship thinking he would go along with the secession of the state, because that's what Latham and others had committed themselves to do. Governor Latham says, if Lincoln is elected, we will take California out of the Union. That's the governor of the state of California. So there was insurgency underfoot in California. So <clears throat> prior to the 1860 election, the national elections, there was still this problem with Broderick. Broderick had seemed to, you know, stifled the ambitions of these guys, uh, the Confederates now, uh, for some time. If you go to the next slide, you'll see some more of the players in this. Here's David Terry on your left, though he should be on the right, I think. Uh, this, is, this guy was uh, from Texas. He was 6'3", 250 pounds. <laughs> and he resigned his position in the, US, in the state Supreme Court in order to challenge Broderick to a duel, which stupidly Broderick eventually accepted, in order to murder him. And a duel in September uh, in uh, 1860 out in San Francisco the exact same operation that was used to kill Alexander Hamilton. Terry's people had filed down the firing pin on Broderick's gun, so it went off with just a flick of the finger. And then he shot and killed Broderick, who died about a day or so later. And as, as Broderick's words that were, his dying words, that were quoted by Baker at the eulogy, which brought out the entire city of San Francisco, some 50,000 people. Uh, Baker said at the eulogy, quoting Broderick, they have killed me because I was opposed to a corrupt administration and the extension of slavery, unquote. So here you have the convenient murder of the leading political opponent for the Confederacy operations of secession in California. And what stopped them were the pro-Union Democrats along with a few Republicans. Now, Baker himself left California after this incident because he had been re he had some people come down from Oregon who had asked him to run for the U.S. Senate because Oregon was just joining the Union, which he did. He became a senator from Oregon and then later joined the Union Army and was c killed during the Civil War, unfortunately. But here you have this guy who resigned. He was put up on charges of murder, Terry, for assassinating Broderick. And because of uh, political games, uh, there was not a trial, uh, really. Uh, then you have this gentleman over here on the far right, Stephen Field, whose brother was the one who laid the first transcontinental cable across the Atlantic Ocean. And he was a, a lawyer. He was the leading expert on property and mineral rights in not just California, probably in the country. And he was a ally of... Uh, of uh, Downey. So what happened after the assassination of Broderick is that there was a meeting of the state legislature. In those days, the legislature voted on who would be 
the senators from that state. It wasn't a popular vote. So every state got two senators, and the legislature picked them. So they had a vote, and they voted up the newly elected governor, this Lecompton Democrat, George Latham. He became the, the new U.S. senator replacing Broderick. So he had two pro-Confederates in the U.S. Senate from California. The governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor James Gately Downey, replaced um, uh, Latham as governor of California. Go to the next slide. Now, Downey, I am amazed at how little, if anything, is written in any of the history books used in this state about this gentleman, only to list him as, you know, one of the governors. They usually say um, Leland Stanford, he was the great Civil War general. He was only governor for a year. And that was in, in 63, 1863. At that time, the, the term for governor was only two years. It was Downey who was governor when the prover proverbial fecal material hit the fan over the secession <laughs> movement in the United States. This traitor in the White House had directed arms to be uh, surreptitiously taken from U.S. armies and hidden for secessionists in various parts of the United States, including in the Presidio, Presidio in uh, San Francisco. Uh, the, the head of the Presidio, who was a Texan, fortunately was not a scumbag, a uh, graduate of West Point, and did not go along with the clandestine operations for the coup to occur. Sherman was conscripted in to lead the opposition against the uh, planned uprising, and Downey supported it all the way. He would not allow the secession of California. And it's because of his actions in supporting Sherman and others in San Francisco that California did not go with the secessionist movement. Not only that, he put out the word on every single member of the uh, promoter of the Confederacy in the state government that were began hightailing it out of town, getting on ships in San Francisco like when they gave the intelligence to the military and they actually picked him up and arrested him in uh, Mississippi, I believe. So here you have a situation where the governor plays an absolutely critical role keeping California in the Union. Because if you think about it, I mean, there's not much written about California's involvement in the Civil War. There weren't any great battles here. There were a few uprisings that were put down, Bakersfield, San Bernardino, and Visalia. But that was about it. But they did send 16,000 people to fight in the Civil War. And more importantly, they kept the western flank of the Union behind, uh, uh, they secured it. Because if California had gone with the Confederacy, and the plan was to bring the territories of New Mexico and Arizona, you would have a whole swath across the entire southern United States that would be part of the Confederacy. So the western flank would have been, at that point, the Rocky Mountains, right? not the Pacific Ocean. So this is an absolutely critical part of the of maintaining the Union. And Downey had no illusions about what was at stake, as well as the international implications uh, involved. Now, he gave, I want to just read you a very brief passage. I was able to get this from the State Archives. This is State of the Union. And actually, he was married to a native uh, of uh, Spanish descent of, of uh, Los Angeles. And he was quite, quite, quite well aware of the British involvement in trying to overthrow the Republic of Mexico at the same time. Uh, this is just a brief quote. He says, the, the <clears throat> union of the states is not only necessary to the existence of Republican institutions on this continent, but it is the only hope of the oppressed nationalists of Europe and their aspirations for liberal laws and equal rights. The same combinations of monarchical power and wealth have heretofore been successfully in uh, heretofore have been successful in crushing Republican ideas upon the Eastern continent. Wherever they begin to obtain ascendancy in any portion of Europe, the increasing power and greatness of the American Union had inspired hope in the oppressed of Eastern nations that in due time the policy asserted by us 
on this continent non-interference of European monarchies in crushing out Republican institutions would be extended there. So he had a clear idea of the international role that he, with his leadership was playing in California and what the implications were, not just for the United States or California, but for the world, that there would be nations and not just plantations, be they in Europe or in the, in the New World. Now, as governor, I'll just mention a couple of the very important things he did for the general welfare. He stressed education, for the, not just for the rich, but for every individual. Every child had to have an equal education to understand science and literature, or you don't have a republic. Uh, he said that quite directly. Uh, he was the one who first committed to building the state capitol in Sacramento, though the, the territory had been there. He built the capitol building, set that into motion, also built the first uh, this would be important today, the first insane asylum. Uh, the first real uh, institutional structures for orphans. Um, this first state library. Right? The first university, which we had none. And he was involved in a project that changed California. He uh, put together a commission. Actually, you know, one of the first things he did when he was governor is much like what's happening today with the privatization of our ports. <laughs> so this was going on in San Francisco at that time. They were called the bulkheaders, people that were privatizing the waterfront in San Francisco. And they, they sent this lawyer to meet with uh, Downey uh, to persuade him with some pecuniary uh, 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 exchanges if he would support the bulkheaders. And what Downey said is, quote, my conscience is not for sale. This bill, and you know it, would only serve to bulge the pockets of the bulkheaders at the expense of the people of San Francisco. Go back to the gangsters now and tell them that this governor cannot be bought. Would that we had a governor that could say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they, well, this was real. Would that they made a, mo a movie about somebody like this. <laughs> Not starring Arnie. No. So this is the tenor of him, because he, he understood that his political life was going to be pretty much shot. I mean, here he, he went against his own faction of his party uh, to stand up for what was right, to keep the United States in the Union. Now, what he put together was a commission on... Uh, Agriculture, which he helped actually finance, and sent this Hungarian-born gentleman, uh, Harasti, uh, Augustin Harasti, to Europe and the Middle East, and he brought back 100,000 cuttings and living vines of grapes, but also nuts, citrus fruits, and other well-known agricultural commodities that are now grown in California. He's the one who is given responsibility for developing the Zinfandel varietal wine, the singular wine of California that we developed. And that is all due to Mr. Downey, Governor Downey. Now, during the Civil War, go to the next slide. He did this all in one year? Two years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to do. So this is the drum barracks. The first thing that happened in Los Angeles during the Civil War, and it was well known that the, this was a hotbed of the Confederacy, is Phineas Banning, whose mission in life, he was from Delaware, was to build a port in the city of Los Angeles. And he donated part of his property to the U.S. Army. I mean, the U.S. Army in Los Angeles was a handful of people. It was Fort Tijon, uh, not too far away but not that close either. And um, he donated these prefabricated buildings which were used as barracks. You can see this is a camel. There was, as part of the Camel Corps, actually that Jeff Davis had set up, brought camels from the Middle East, and they were actually based up in Fort Tijon, and they were brought down there from, to here during that period. Go to the next slide. 
There's Phineas Banning. Next slide. Now, this is the state of public transportation infrastructure in Los Angeles. It's the main road leading out of the San Fernando Valley. Though I might say it's probably easier to get over than traffic uh, at rush hour on the five. But that was infrastructure. Go to the next one. Now here you had the first communications network set up, the telegraph system, which was established on the West Coast, actually both in, in the Northwest and in Los Angeles and California during uh, the Civil War. And the first communication over this telegraph was a message from Governor Downey to Lincoln pledging to keep California in the Union. Now, let's, let's talk about deserts. Next slide. Let's think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's contemplate it. Are deserts natural? I don't know. Let's find out. This desert, where is this desert actually? No, it's Namibia. It's in Africa. Now, a desert is classified as a region which gets 10 inches or less rain annually. One third of the earth is desert. That's about 12 million square miles. If you look at the next map, you see this regions that are colored. Here, the darker the color into the red is the more intense uh, desert area. That is a hyper arid area. You can see this swath that goes across Africa into Asia and down into Australia. Next slide. And there is a NASA, uh, actually it's a compilation of photos and colorized. It gives you this pretty good idea of this huge region of northern Africa through the Arabian Peninsula, across Iran, up into uh, Russia, northern northwest part of India, Tibet, and China. It is a huge swath of land. Go to the next slide. This is the biggest desert in the world. <laughs> this was actually omitted in uh, um, Dennis Small's article on deserts. It covers one-tenth of the land area of the world. You know what it is? It's Antarctica. Doesn't have to be hot to be a desert. That's a little tougher to colonize, I'd say, than uh, the Mojave Desert. Now, what is required to build a city in a desert? Well, it takes more than one human being. Right? It's not this castaway concept of some kind of extension where uh, Robinson Crusoe could build a city in a desert. Uh, it takes a society of at least three generations, three generations to accomplish that. So you have to have the cognitive infrastructure, that is schools, educational programs, medical facilities as well, health care, the old folks home like we have here downstairs, and, <laughs> and the physical requirements. What's the primary substance? required. Water. This commodity. For drinking and irrigation. Next slide. Here you see early Los Angeles before rush hour. <laughs> this is the old part of town. You can still go visit it and see the, the uh, mission church is still there. Alvera Street. Right? That's the center of town. In Los Angeles, El Pueblo, El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles was named by uh, Father Juan Crespi. And when he recorded, standing near a small, quote, beautiful river from the northwest located at 34 degrees 10 minutes, unquote. And he named 
the site which became the town after a chapel in the uh, in the uh, Franciscan church in northern Italy, the Assisi Chapel. Actually, I misspoke about uh, Junipero Serra being a Dominican. He was a Franciscan. Um, now, the third governor of California, Felipe de Neve, whose statue is down at Alvera Street, uh, recommended to Carlos III, whose statue is also down in Alvera Street, <coughs> dedicated by uh, his descendant who came here a few years ago, established this Pueblo along the Los Angeles River on September 4th, eight, uh, 1781. A band of 40 people left the San Gabriel Mission and <coughs> to found the Pueblo of Los Angeles. Um, all were Catholics, and they were predominantly African American. Now, in 1850, the population of Los Angeles and Orange County was about 8,300 people, half of whom were Native Indians. There were 272 residents in the city, that is, structures, no schools, no library, no newspaper, no church. There was one two story building. In 1854, there were 100,000 cows in Los Angeles County. Cattle. Los Angeles is known as the queen of the cow counties. Unfortunately, between 1862 and 64, there was a great drought. Not one drop of rain fell. Until March of 1864, the cows died. <laughs> Hence, a necessity posed, water, right? Now, if you look at the next slide, you'll see this is maybe not quite as, is more, fairly more recent, but it gives you an idea of dry land farming that was done uh, for wheat without irrigation at all. Now, no, the next slide, please. Zana Madre, this is the sort of a schematic of the original water system. The LA River was here, and there was a, a system of small reservoirs up where Dodger Stadium is, Elysium Park here. This is where Figueroa is, or actually the freeway 110 coming through here now, and Alvera Street being down here. And they would bring the water up, next slide, by this wheel, they would bring it up and going to use gravity to go and feed it into a reservoir. Right? And the LA River, of course, is only a few hundred yards from our office here. So you had this mother ditch, the giver of life, and she was not always too giving because the watershed of the LA River was not that big. So by 1863, most of these uh, ditches, these zanas, uh, uh, were in need of having more in them, basically, uh, as, a, as a water source. Now, Downey, who had returned to Los Angeles after being governor, undertook the task of building a city in the desert, that is, Los Angeles. In 1873, he addressed an irrigation convention in Los Angeles and saying the following, I suggest that the Commonwealth exert its jurisdiction over every stream in the state and enact such equitable laws as will extend their usefulness to the utmost capacity. The riparian or property rights maintained in England and recognized in many of our states as the law governing rivers and streams do not apply to California. This right is expressly reserved to the nation as public servitude, unquote. Now that's a good idea of the general welfare and how we have to treat commodities such as water. Uh, <clears throat> we'll return to water issue in a minute. We're going to go to some of the other infrastructure. Next slide. This is a topographical map of the state, Los Angeles being down here. And what you can see that we have, thank God, this great mountain range, the Sierras that extend from Southern California up into the Northwest, a smaller range along here in the great Central Valley. San Francisco. Now, if you'll notice the location of Los Angeles, these uh, mountains come right down to the shore here, 
and on this side, except for a very small passageway down by the San, Fran San, uh, uh, San Ofri nuclear power plants just south of San Clemente, where the five goes down to uh, San Diego. That thin strip was about it. Everything else, if you wanted to get out of here and to connect to the Transcontinental Railroad, which was going through the Sierras and over the Sierras into San Francisco, easy enough to extend down the valley, but you'd have to get over the Tehachapi Mountains here. That was the problem. <coughs> so you had Phineas Banning, for one, who was working on uh, setting up the port, but also working with Downey. He set up the first telegraph and Pioneer Oil Company with Downey at that time. And in 1869, established the Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad. This ran down the Alameda Corridor, where Alameda is today, from downtown all the way down to south to uh, San Pedro, the port of, where the Port of Los Angeles is today. Uh, 21 miles. That was the first railroad built in Southern California. Now, if you go to the next slide, of course, the main engine for generating wealth and exporting it was the completion of the, the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, initiated under President Abraham Lincoln and finished in 1869. This gave the basis for California to actually develop. It would not be able to develop without this, regardless of the port access or not. So you have that completed. Then you had the so-called Big Four rail companies being uh, created at that time, Huntington, Crocker, Stanford, and Hopkins. And they were not really interested in building a railroad to Los Angeles, this cow town, literally. <coughs> even though the governor kept trying to persuade them. They even tried to make a deal by giving them, mostly uh, Stanford and then and, and, uh, uh, the Southern Pacific, the entire you know Los Angeles, San Pedro Railroad. They, they were going to raise money and, and so on and so forth. They even consulted with uh, Thomas Scott. Uh, from San Actually, Thomas Scott was head of the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. He had been head of logistics under Lincoln during the Civil War, the first one to move troops by rail line. And he was the expert on logistics uh, during the Civil War. And he tried to make a deal, that is, Downey, uh, with Scott to try to get a southern route, that is, to have the connection go from Los Angeles down through San Diego and out along the southern route. That didn't work out. Eventually, they did succeed in landing a contract with the Big Four. If you go to the next slide, uh, this gives you an idea, actually, a progression of the rail development. This is in the 1880s. You can also see a number of routes, the southern and northern routes. The next slide is from the 1890s. So you can see the high concentration, which still exists to this day, on the East Coast. There ain't too much in the deserts. Either, right? So... If you go to the next slide, what we have in 1871, right, this is, this is only two years after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. On September 4th, a train left from Alameda Station, which is pretty close to where the current rail station is downtown. Uh, <clears throat> and it went north up through the San Fernando Railroad Tunnel. This was the big obstacle, remember, in getting through the mountains. This tunnel... Uh, with the help of the Chinese, 1,000 Chinese laborers, uh, they were able to, in one year, dig this 6,940-foot tunnel, making it the third longest tunnel in the United States. This is uh, up in uh, uh, the northern part, northeastern part of San Fernando Valley. Is it still functioning? Uh, that, I, no, I don't think so. I think there's, there's other routes. They went up along the Tehachapi. But I'm not sure. I don't know. So they went up to Tehachapi, and they had a golden spike ceremony with some of the big four um, railroad, California railroad entrepreneurs and so forth. And that linked Los Angeles with the rest of the country. Right? Extremely important. We'll go back to water. Next slide. Another Irishman born in Ireland, like Downey. William Mulholland got off a boat. He was a seaman in Los Angeles and decided to get some work digging a ditch, or actually digging a hole for actually uh, a, uh, it was an artesian well that Downey was having built 
in uh, South Central Los Angeles area. It's actually Mulholland got very interested in studying archaeology because of what he found. I'm not sure what he did find, but that's the story. And he arrives in Los Angeles in 1877, so that's six years after the rail lines connected. The population of Los Angeles City is about 9,000 people. There's still these nine ditches that are providing water from the L.A. River. It's its only source. They have some reserve capacity with the reservoir system, but even th those would occasionally collapse, so they weren't very reliable. The L.A. City Water Company was privatized at this time. It had been public, and they pr was privatized. Now, <clears throat> in 1902, the uh, L.A. City Water Company was bought out by the city of Los Angeles again. So they stopped the privatization. This was a big battle at the time. And uh, Mulholland uh, said at one of these meetings that uh, you might as well, talking about privatization of water, he said, you may as well suggest a man that he lease his wife. <laughs> so now the L.A. City. The Department of Water and Power, which was founded in, in large part by Downey personally, uh, could start the job of retrieving and transporting water to the citizens of this fair town. Now, where's that water going to come from? Next slide. Okay, here are the natural rivers in the state of California, right? You'll notice a lot of them have an east-west configuration because of their runoff from the Sierras and some along the eastern side of the mountains and, of course, quite a bit in the northwest part of the city, even some down here. So that's your resource. Next slide shows you the watershed of the great watershed of California and the Sierras, this region here. This is where the majority of your runoff water comes from. This is why it's so important to have snow packs at this time of year in the Sierras, because that will eventually become your drinking and bathing water, right? And the water used to grow the vegetables and livestock and so on. So this is, this is the resource you're talking about. There's not much here in Los Angeles. This is where it is. Next slide. Now, what Mulholland did was to personally map out, survey, and construct the uh, longest aqueduct project of that time, except for one. This was about uh, 240 miles. Coolgardie in Australia was 307 miles. Now, there's a funny story about that, but I won't tell it. Uh, so. What, you, what basically Mulholland is doing is taking water on the east side of the Sierra Range in Inyo County, Owens Valley, and then siphoning it down through a series of tunnels, canals, some of them covered, some of them not, uh, all the way down to the city of Los Angeles. Now, how did they do it? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it's not that big of a city. It's a big project. Well... Los Angeles uh, newspaper in 1905. This plan was announced in July 29th of 1905 to bring this water down from the Owens Valley. Uh, Owens Valley in Inyo County. And the newspaper that day announced in its headlines, Big Deal in Water, Water Supply for 2 Million People. Now, what happened is that the city put forward a bond that was voted on and passed for $24 million dollars for a population of 10,000 people. Now, can you imagine today what would happen if you went into a, a small town or a city council <laughs> on, the, on the order of magnitude of dollars? This is like two million point dollars for every person. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it boggles the mind. I mean, today we have, you know, the cult beliefs of free trade and so forth, that this would be impossible. You've got to balance the books. How are you going to do it? You could never, it would never happen. Los Angeles would have never happened under the free trade policies of these lunatics today. But they did it. Now, in 1805, three years later, San Francisco began the Hetch Hetchy Dam Project to provide water 
uh, to the San Francisco Bay Area, and that was completed in 18, uh, 1921. To go to the next slide, this gives you an idea. This is a picture, actually, that I took during the summer up on Morro Rock in the Sierras, which Frankie knows well, looking up. You're already at 8,000 feet, and you're looking up at the top of the uh, Sierra Range, which is a, another 4,000 plus feet. You, if you go out in the parking lot or you go up to Mount Wilson tonight, you're going up how high? 5,700 feet. So imagine Mount Wilson being three times higher. Right? That's the kind of mountain range that we're blessed with to get this kind of water. It's not so blessed when you're trying to get a railroad through it, but <laughs> for water it's good. Next slide. <coughs> So here's a topographical map, a Humboldtian topography map that shows the 7,000 level. This is where Mono Lake is, the beginning of the water movement project, down through a series of uh, uh, canyons, particularly Jawbone Siphon, which is quite a contrast here in elevation and back up again all the way down to the two to three hundred foot level of LA City proper. All right? Now that is quite a job. It's not just a linear building of a of a pipeline or something. You've got to take all these things into account to construct a, a, a series of different mechanisms to transport this water. So <clears throat> you go to the next slide. How it was done was that putting together old and new technologies steam shovels, something new, uh, a steam tractor for the first time being used. In fact, it was going up a hill and it was going, to, going sideways and Mulholland called it a caterpillar. And that's where we get the term caterpillar tractor from. Next slide. Here we have some workers lining a ditch with cement, finishing it off. <clears throat> now, in order to build this aqueduct, first of all, they had to build roads and where they were possible to build rail lines out to the construction sites. They had to build power plants and transmission lines to provide power, telephone lines, 40 housing camps for 3,000 workers. There was an aqueduct medical department created and a cement factory built in Tehachapi. So they had to build one tunnel that was two miles, over 10,000 feet long, at the Red Rock Canyon and then lining it uh, with cement in 15 months. Uh, why don't you go to the next slide, please? Okay, here you go. This is the old Model T in the pipe. And this steel, uh, actually iron pipe, was sh actually forged on the East Coast and shipped around the southern tip of Ibero America to the port of Los Angeles and then transport it up into the high desert. <laughs> now these, these lengths of pipe were 36 feet long, seven and a half feet in diameter, and weighed 28 or 26 tons each. Next slide. Now here you can see mule teams. They had to actually develop and keep whole you know, uh, herds of, of mules to help this process because tractors couldn't go everywhere. Uh, next slide. This is the construction of Jawbone Canyon Siphon. This is one of the, the biggest jobs of the entire project. So you can see there's a combination of mechanical devices and horsepower being all driven by human mind power. Next. Okay, here's what it looks like today, and it's still working. Next slide. Here's some of the local natives <laughs> getting the pro the uh, so you can get an idea. Look at this. See, each of these these tubes, these pipes are connected by a collar that's riveted. Right. Next slide will give you an idea of the the dy dynamic of this thing. This is on the the, the uh, west side. This is the east side. Comes down and up on the other side of the canyon. Next slide. This is the new pipeline that is running parallel to the old one. Now notice this. This is all butt welded. This is modern technology developed during World War II and building the 
uh, steel plated victory ships. Next slide. Okay, opening day. So, on November 5th, 1913, the aqueduct was open. There were 3,000 people attending. Here's the water cascading down the north end of the San Fernando Valley. And William Mulholland says, here it is, take it. So, you had international uh, rippling effect from this project of engineers, skilled workmen who were deployed on it that went on to build power plants in places like Spain, Argentina, to build railroads there and in Chile, uh, building power plants in Japan, also the Philippines, Hawaii, Brazil, Bolivia, and all along the Pacific coast. Next, Mulholland, at the age of 68 in 1923, decides this is not enough water. And he's right. He surveys 50,000 square miles of desert east of Los Angeles and, to, and northeast to determine the route of the Colorado River aqueduct uh, that created the Metropolitan Water District, which basically coordinates water distribution for the entire southern part of California in six counties. Next slide. A little more of the different infrastructure. Now, when uh, Phineas Banning started his project to build the L.A. River, I mean, if you read Richard Dana's book, Two Years Before the Mass, he talks about California in the 40s. There were no ports. There were no docks. Except maybe in San Diego, that was it. And Monterey. There were docks there. Everywhere else they had to stop. Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Dana Point down in, in, in Orange County, they would have to throw their furs, which is one of the things they were bartering and trading with. They would throw them down the hill, take them on their head through the water till they could finally get to a rowboat to take it out to the ship. Right? This was the standard practice in Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, all the way up and down the coast. And so Phineas Banning set up the first shack. <laughs> this isn't it. This is, this, is, this is a much later one in 1851 uh, in San Pedro. If you look at the next uh, uh, slide, <laughs> You'll see what happened. In 1871, um, you had the first dredging of the main canal to 10 feet depth because ships could not come close to the land at all. It had to be dredged out. And so you, at this point, now you had a functioning harbor. The U.S. Congress certified in that year the San, San Pedro as an international port and began exporting things like lumber, 50,000 tons of lumber and coal per year. So what you have here, you can see in this map, this is sort of the outline of the old terrain here, and then basically you have landfill, where you have the, the uh, Terminal Island Bridge that goes here, the Vincent Thomas Bridge, over to Terminal Island. This is all landfill, right? And of course, the, the jetties here and so forth are added later. But there was a big battle over the building this port. The railroad interest, Southern Pacific, had bought all the land along Santa Monica to be the terminus for their railroad, and they wanted the port built in Santa Monica. Now, everybody here has seen Santa Monica. Does that look like a natural port to you? No. No, it's not. So there's a huge fight that went on for some years. Finally, the Army Corps of Engineers, backed up by the, the commandant for the, uh, the Army on the West Coast, based at the Presidio, Douglas MacArthur's father, Arthur MacArthur, uh, backed up the Army Corps of Engineers' plans to finally build the port where it is today. And this was a big political fight. Uh, Senator Stephen Mallory White, who was a protege of Downey, was the one who carried the water, if you will, to get the bill passed to build this port. And he said at the opening of the port in 1899, at the Jubilee Festival held down at the port, and there's a statue of him down there. People may have seen it when we had the Condre School. He said uh, something fairly prescient. He said, fellow citizens, the missionary Father Junipero Serra knew the truth when he spoke, when he chose these spots as fit for habitation. He understood the capabilities of his surroundings. He read the future. Your course is toward the stars. Your culmination is yet to come. So next slide will show 1920, the modern harbor as it actually is today. This was originally Project 2000 now 2006, and you have these bulk containerized operations 
as well as the container operations, which are great. The only problem is once the containers get off the ship, there's the bottleneck. There's no rail lines to take the containers to where they should go. So you have this huge uh, bottleneck of basically independent truckers scrambling over decaying uh, highway systems trying to ship these goods to where they're supposed to be. You don't have a real centralized rail system. <coughs> so <coughs> the state population in 1920, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the San Fernando Valley devoid of much plant or any kind of life, a little bit. Uh, the population of the state was over 3, three million people, 3,400,000. L.A. and Orange County had grown to 988,000 people. Next slide will show you an irrigated citrus grove in that valley. Next slide shows you the transportation system that was built during this period, the famous red car system that you could actually literally take a series of trolleys from the top of Mount Wilson, or close to the top, all the way down to the port and even out to uh, Riverside, of course, through Orange County and so forth. And this was built primarily by Huntington. And they had uh, 1,150 miles of track. They had four counties with 900 cars. In 1944, during the height of war production in World War II, they had 109 million passengers. So the Port of Los Angeles, of course, this was all torn up after World War II, ridiculously. And the Port of Los Angeles at this time, 1920, was exporting. It was the largest oil exporting port in the United States, thanks to Doheny, exporting 12 million barrels per year. Export of lumber uh, to the ports of South America actually built most of the ports, the lumber that was shipped through L.A., and in 1920, we have the biggest trade deal in world history signed between a business consortium in California and Lenin, Vladimir Lenin of the Soviet Union. This was a trade deal that had nothing to do with Wall Street, nothing to do with Threadneedle Street of London. No, none of these establishment banks were involved in it. It was put together by Edward Doheny, who had developed the oil industry in California and also in Mexico, and a number of other people in California. It involved a uh, leasing of the Kamchatka Peninsula in uh, Russia for coal and other materials. They had put together a fleet of freighters and, and other uh, transportation. They were exporting to Russia whole plants, power generation plants, rail lines, everything down to condensed uh, cans of milk. Uh, an incredible deal, $3 billion deal between a bunch of California capitalists and Russian communists. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not how, how the world worked back then. And it was sabotaged by the highest levels of British intelligence, including H.G. Wells, who went to Lenin himself including Lloyd George, who went to the chief geological engineer who lived just down the street here, who put this thing together. And it was ultimately sabotaged. It had more to do with the assassination or the murder of, of uh, President Harding at that time and then the Teapot Dome scandals, which uh, destroyed the reputations and independent oil operations of Doheny here and also of... Uh, uh, Sinclair, Sinclair, who had just made a deal with the Russians to develop the Baku oil fields and took it away from uh, Dieterding of, uh, of uh, Royal Dutch Shell. So the Depression hits in t beginning in 29 with the stock market collapse. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So, like Los Angeles financing a 24 million dollar water project with 10 million with uh, 10,000 people FDR undertakes the necessity of not just putting people back to work but to actually build the necessary infrastructure to sustain and develop the population and it centers around water projects the first and foremost thing about a water project is to stop flooding because people die when when there's flooding that's the primary reason and this also destroys property agriculture and commercial property. 
That's the primary reason. Secondarily, then you can use the water with the reservoirs for irrigation, and thirdly, for power generation. So you had a series of these projects on the, uh, Cal the Colorado Basin here, particularly the Grand Coulee Dam, but it wasn't, there was actually a series of smaller dams and projects connected with this overall scheme. The Tennessee Valley Authority project, of course, uh, and the Northwest Grand Coulee being the most well-known uh, dam there. Um, the Central Valley Act in California to develop the water potential for irrigation in particular was passed by the California legislature in 1933. They even had a $170 million bond that they were going to put out to the voters, but they couldn't get a bank to back it up. <laughs> so the bonds were unmarketable. Guess what? There was a depression. So the federal government took over the project. Next slide. Here you have an old poster advocating uh, the support for this centralized government infrastructure project for development of the Central Valley of California, right? So the, uh, the uh, Department of Interior Bureau of Reclamation took it over. It included building a series of dams, the biggest of which was the uh, Shasta Dam County, or Shasta Dam in Shasta County, and the uh, Friant Dam, Friant. Friant Dam, rather, in the southern part of the state. We got the uh, now this this was not the uh, this was the culmination of a of a long process of investigating the potential for water development in this area of California. It goes back actually to President uh, Ulysses S. Grant in 1873, who commissioned the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to investigate the whole Central Valley uh, potential for irrigation. And in 1919, you had another. Um, U.S. Geological Survey under this guy, Lieutenant Robert Marshall, uh, who proposed transporting water from the Sacramento River system through the valley, the San Joaquin Valley, and over the Tehachapi Mountains down into Southern California. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a, a few of the projects here in, as they came out. This is the Shasta Dam. This was the big project in Northern California. Uh, during the Depression, the, the uh, Hoover Dam, or the Boulder Dam, it was, it was called then, uh, <coughs> built here. And this, these dams were built in basically in six years, six to seven years. And, of course, the huge, humongous Grand Coulee Dam in the northwest. Um, and this also created the potential not, o not only for irrigation but for the power generation, which, of course, would be used in fighting the fascists in World War II. Um, now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that the continuation of this uh, momentum continued, that is the FDR legacy now, into the 50s and the 1960s. In California, that was represented by Governor Edmund, known as Pat Brown. And you see him here uh, pressing the button <laughs> that creates the explosion that starts the construction of the Owens Dam in Northern California. And this was a huge undertaking. This top of this dam is two miles long. This is the spillway here, uh, releasing excess water from the lake behind it. <coughs> now, <coughs> of course, after World War II, what did you have? You had Eisenhower, and you had the highway construction program for the United States. That, in particular, along with the war mobilization, had created a great migration into California. There was no plan for water development in the state. In 1951, the state engineer, Robert Edmondson, presented a water project proposal to the legislature that became known as the State Water Project. Uh, and nothing was being done about it until uh, Bob Edmondson took Pat Brown aside. He just buttonholed him in the state building and got an earful. He gave him an earful of the necessity for the water crisis. And Pat Brown said, what crisis? What are you talking about? <coughs> and Edmondson went through the facts of the immigration of people, the uh, available water, and the need to create a new water system. 
And this became the mission of Pat Brown during his tenure as governor, and rightfully so. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a uh, schematic of that, beginning with the Owens, the Oroville Dam. Oroville. I said Owens. I meant Oroville Dam before. This created the basis to have the water reserves, along with the canals, what we call a peripheral canal today, to link water to, particularly to uh, Alameda and uh, Santa Clara counties, right, on the respectively on the east and southern part of the Bay Area, and of course San Francisco itself, and then the longest aqueduct. So you had a series of projects. The Oroville Dam was the world's tallest dam at that time and the fourth most massive dam. The San Luis Dam, which is down here, uh, would be the fifth most massive dam, two miles long as well. And the world's longest aqueduct was part of this configuration, bringing water from the uh, this part of the state the down the Feather River, yeah, down to the Tehachapi Mountains, where they built the world's highest pump lift for water, 3,400 feet, to take it over the Tehachapi Mountains through a pipe through a series of pipelines. This uh, necessitated the manufacturing of the world's most powerful water pumps, of ba five batteries of them, in fact, and also a chain of smaller dams and reservoirs throughout the whole system. Uh, you go to the next slide. You'll see the products of the Central Valley with its aqueduct. In fact, the original design called to have this covered. There would be a cover over to uh, decrease evaporation. So everybody who's driven along the five through the Central Valley's undoubtedly seen this canal. And that provided the basis to have a secure source of water for the kind of irrigation that the Central Valley represented in terms of agricultural production, something we need to get going again uh, to feed the world. How deep is this now? It's only, if, I'm not sure, it varies. It's about, what, five feet deep in some places? I'm not sure. Money. This is, this is, the, uh, this is the thing that Pat Brown did. <laughs> he lied about how much it would cost. He didn't have as much faith in the Californians as... Uh, uh, this, this, the residents of Los Angeles did <laughs> uh, back in 1905. He said that the cost would be about $1.8 billion. Right? And this is in the late 1950s, early 60s we're talking about. Actually, it cost $3 billion, and that's in $13 billion in 1987 dollars. So that's what we're talking about. However, I, I find it in my heart to forgive him of this sin. Because a lot of people's lives depended on it, and he did the right thing. Now, what you had, if you, I guess, go to the next slide, please. So here you have the water sources that Los Angeles depends on. It comes from, there was another uh, aqueduct built parallel to the Los Angeles aqueduct in the 1970s. So you actually have two aqueducts going up through the Owens Valley. You have the a Colorado River aqueduct bringing water from the Colorado River. And the water used by the Colorado River, not just only by California, but by Arizona and other states, they use 100% of all the water of that river. You had the state water projects, the aqueduct I mentioned, we just mentioned yeah, through the Central Valley. And you have a series of underground aquifers in the city of Los Angeles, including, we're probably standing on one. Sparklets uses it uh, to make their water. They purify it through reverse <laughs> osmosis, that is forcing it through plastic membrane and putting it in plastic bottles. And <clears throat> so that's what you have. And the problem with the aquifers, the problem with the Olagala aquifer in the central part of the country in Texas and Oklahoma is that they've been used to the point where there's not much water in it. And the water that's in it is highly saline. So you're putting salt. And it's the same problem we have in California. 
is that the more you rely upon the aquifers, the more salt you're putting on the land, which is detrimental to growing anything. Right? So that it's much more dangerous than chemicals, uh, this putting salt on land. I mean, you're, you're destroying the, the potential. The Carthage, what they did in Carthage after the, they finally beat them again, they, put, they sowed salt into the agricultural fields around Carthage. Mm -hmm. So nothing would grow. <coughs> yes. So what we've done is that uh, we have projects since this time in the state and in Southern California which have been undertaken for water, but they are only for reserve capacity. They're not providing any new water. Right? So we take a look at the next picture. People who were at this cadre school had a chance a few years ago to go visit this. This was the is the uh, Diamond Valley Lake Reservoir. And what you this is out in Riverside County. And this is uh, they actually took this uh, hill range and they built a small dam back here and a large one across here and siphoned water in it from the from the Colorado or from the aqueduct, I'm not sure which, because the aqueduct, the LA aqueduct ends in Lake Paris out in Riverside County. So here you have a powerhouse down here, so it also provides some water. Now this was quite an undertaking. This was the largest earthworks construction in US history. And it began in nineteen ninety five. It was they moved hundred and fifteen tons of cubic earth to create these two dams. Hoover Dam, by comparison, they only moved 1.3 million of earth, rock, and concrete. Grand Coulee was only 50.5 million tons of earth and concrete. So this West Dam is a uh, mile and 7.7 uh, miles long. And in May 2001, they started the new electrical generating uh, system. This is the first system that came online in six years in California. Now this holds enough water for 17 million people for six months in Southern California. That's what it's designed to do. It's a strategic reserve, if you will. Go to the next slide, you get an idea. That, and this was all done very quietly. I never saw any green protests or anything. They actually had to stop a little while because they ran across some brontosaurus bones or something. But that, that was about it. So here you have a NASA satellite picture of this lake as it's beginning to be filled. And over here you can see it when it's completed. So it, take, it took one year to fill that reservoir. Right? Okay. I'm not sure. Probably 50 feet or so. I'm not sure. It's enough to hold water to, for 17 million people <laughs> for six months according to the engineers. Go to the next slide. You'll see another reserve capacity reservoir. Remember this picture? Some people thought it was Mars. Uh, actually out here towards the godforsaken town of Needles. In the summer. It's terrible. It's humid. Oh, God, it's terrible. But anyway, we can change that with more water. <laughs> so here's Cadiz. There's actually, there's actually a prison over here. Somewhere. But this, this is an underground... Um, uh, reserve storage facility. It has one million acre feet in this aquifer, and it takes you know one acre foot is is about three hundred twenty five thousand gallons is enough to provide uh, water for two families for a year. And once again, this is reserve capacity. Now this is a project that is a joint project between the Metropolitan Water District and a private company. So that does not bode well. Go to the next slide. Here's kind of the problem we have. <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's an area in California where it seems to rain on one side of this line and not on the other. <laughs> this side is greener than this side. It's the same land. There seems to be this demarcation. Go to the next slide. Here it is again. This is the California-Mexican border. This is the Imperial Valley. That's the Salton Sea. This is Baja. This is Calexico. This is the much larger populated area of Mexicali. And 
The water is coming in here from the American, All-American Canal. It doesn't get across the border. That can change with the development of the kind of water project we need. Next slide, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, if you look at these grids, look at the infrastructure grids, like I was discussing before, sort of like a tissue, a membrane. We have veins running through it. And, that, and see it as a transparency where you have a series of these layers of different kind of membranes as in the living tissue. Here you have power generating plants in California. We used to have nuclear power plants in Rancho Seco. That was shut down. We have still two down in San Onofre, which the guy who is the president of Southern California Edison was as a youth in the National Resources Defense Council financed by the Rockefeller family involved in shutting down nuclear power. He's now the president. He doesn't seem to be committed to continuing uh, nuclear energy generation at this point. And then you have the uh, 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 Diablo Canyon up in San Luis Obispo area, which is the newest facility. That's it for nuclear power. You have all these silly things solar and wind and so forth, which is, is, is a complete waste of money and effort. It doesn't provide the kind of energy required. Next slide. Here you see the transmission lines. And this is all, also a problem. Uh, I don't know if they solved it. I mean, all the excess energy that's produced by the Grand Coulee Dam, they couldn't get it wheat, uh, east. They could only direct it south. And we've seen what happened during the Davis administration when Enron and company ran the energy scam, which we're still trying to recover from, and we won't recover until we get a real energy program and, and regulation. So <coughs> you combine that with the rail, the infrastructure, the water systems, and you have a complicated intermeshed network, like a living tissue. On top of that, you have a communications network. You have landlines. You have, uh, of course, cell phones and optical cable. Then you have the soft infrastructure, the education, the medical, uh, health care facilities, and so forth that create a cognitive net that, if done right, will facilitate not only the development of the human race, but also other living and non-living uh, inhabitants of the planet. So this cognitive power provides a solution and for the necessity of increasing the supply of those materials necessary to continue and escalate that process. Now, the population of California, it's in, in the year 2000, it was 33,800,000. That doesn't include all the illegals from Guatemala, Honduras, <laughs> right? So you had a couple more million, uh, at least, uh, of un undocumented uh, people. Uh, so you're talking about it, and that's really, we really don't know. So we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 million people, right? We do not have the, f the facilities to provide necessary water, power for a population of that size if it, can, if it wants to continue to grow as it should. We don't have it. When you hear these arguments, like you, you heard at the, the UN Water uh, Forum in Mexico City, or you have the greenies today, or the uh, or the budget cutters of all the, of, of whether they're Republican or Democrat, they'll talk about conservation. Well, it's not the kind of conservation we were talking about under FDR. When FDR, when you talk about conservation in the 30s and 40s, you were talking about stopping soil erosion. You were talking about building dams so that you could tame the rivers and control the water. That's what conservation used to mean. What it means today is don't use it. That's all it means. Don't use it. Well, don't you not using something is not producing something. There's the conflict of ideas. When you conserve something, you're not producing something new. And that's where the problem lies. So we have to produce something new. Go to the next slide. This this was the project developed by the Parsons Company over in Pasadena in the 1960s and was sabotaged by Scoop Jackson and a few other idiots in the U.S. Senate that would have provided adequate water up through and today and tomorrow by taking the runoff water from Alaska through a, through a series of natural formations down the Rocky Mountain Trench in particular that would provide 
water that would give you a actually the ability to have barges go from the Great Lakes to the Pacific Ocean and provide water into Mexico, which needs it badly. So it not only are you setting up navigable systems, energy, and that and the and water that could be used for for not just drinking and eating. We need water for industrial processing. We need water for irrigation, and occasionally taking a shower. It's useful, uh, preferably with soap. And that's that's the 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 plan that was put in out in the 1960s. That's what we have to do. This will put, we won't have enough people to actually build this kind of project if we were getting, if we wanted to get serious about it. But that's the kind of thing we have to do. And next slide. Now here, here you've got a project we've talked about for some time in another desert area in Egypt. And if you see here, here's the Nile Delta, which is green, right? Very fertile. To the left, to the right and everywhere else, except for the Mediterranean, you have desert. On this schematic here, here's the delta. There's a huge depression. This actually used to be fertile uh, many, many years ago. The idea here was to blow out or dig a series of canals that would let the Mediterranean go back in to fill this depression. You'd have a huge lake. You would change the climate here. You would create the conditions for uh, underground extraction of brackish water and definitely agriculture. That's one project. And look how badly the Middle East needs water. Next slide. Here you have in the middle of this desert uh, quite an operation going on at the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, this is a project that uh, was taken uh, on by the Sheikh Zahid in 1970s to take this island, Banias Island, just off the coast, where they're connected by a uh, desalination plant, brings water out to the island. They've installed drip irrigation. This is about, uh, this is a, 80% um, of this 230 square kilometer island was planted with mango, lemon, various other fruits, uh, and also they brought in gazelles your ostriches there, uh, pheasants, ducks, geese, I don't know if they're bringing in quail, uh, <laughs> llamas, deer, zebras, swans, uh, 80 different species of birds. Uh, so they've got drip irrigation for trees, shrubs, and so on, and they've been able to lower the temperature of this island about two, three to five percent because of this change of, of the climate that's incurred. We go to the next slide. We see there's an incredible uh, array of desalination plants throughout the Arabian Peninsula area. Saudi Arabia here, uh, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, which has invested a lot of money into these desalination operations. The, the one plant that's, I think it may actually be finally completed by now, but it's partially operational, if not fully, uh, outside of Dubai is capable of producing uh, 100 million imperial gallons per day. And that's enough water to, uh, to supply for 1,200,000 people. And that's what I call desalination. But then again, you're limited. Because what are you limited by? They have gas, natural gas. They have oil to run the turbines to create the heat to flash heat the, the water for the desalination process. But you're limited, and this is a great place to do it. It's not doesn't cost much to transport that energy source. But if you're serious about doing desalination in these other desert regions, you've got to have nuclear power. There's no way about it. Next slide. Now, here's something you don't usually see in the desert, fish farming. And they're harvesting this, these fish here. This is from desalinated water in the United Arab Emirates. So growing fish in the desert. Who'd have thunk it? Next slide. Next slide, Mike. Okay, here you have an attempt at desalination by a private interest in, in uh, Huntington Beach. This Poseidon Corporation, which is owned by 
uh, Warburg Pincus, Inc. And this water privatization is a big deal. When I got up this morning, I, I turned on the TV and I was watching on C-SPAN a water conference given by the American Enterprise Institute. <laughs> and they're talking about how the, you know, the great new sunrise industry of privatized water and how the evil United Nations wants to centralize water and so on, and isn't this terrible? And don't they know that entrepreneurs can make lots of money? I mean, provide water to a few people? And so this is part of this process where they're taking, basically refurbishing one of these uh, power plants down in Santa Monica. This is on PCH down here. And uh, fitting it for doing uh, desalination. Now, I just came across something and I was looking through a file on research I had done back in <clears throat> 1988 and I had met with some people at the Metropolitan Water District and here is a study and this isn't the right one where they put forward a project they had spent ah oh, here it is no that's not it either oh, well. I'll find it it's and basically what it says is that the uh, Metropolitan Water District had spent $300,000 to do a study to build high temperature gas reactors, nuclear reactors, uh, for desalination purposes. And this had to be part of the overall project to, to create new water supplies. Actually, and they own the land that's just north of this on PCH between Seal Beach, the marsh flats there. That's one of the proposed sites for it. <clears throat> it's something we need to look at again. These are, these are projects, like there was one in Carlsbad in the 60s as well, that are on the drawing board. They've already done the engineering. And in certain cases, we have more advanced nuclear technology than what they were working with back then when some of these plans were put together. Modular units that can be mass produced. This is what we, we've already got on the boards. It's a question of a political decision to do it. Uh, next slide. Now here's how you solve the Middle East crisis. Which LaRouche has been talking about for a long time. His Oasis project. You want to stop terrorism, those Arab terrorists? Give them nuclear power. <laughs> That'll shut them up. <laughs> Give those Palestinians nuclear energy. Give the Persians nuclear energy. Give Jordan nuclear power. Give Lebanon, which needs it badly. They need everything they can get. And throughout Egypt, this whole region needs nuclear power. It is the only way you can create the kind of necessary freshwater production in this region of the world. So the real idea of being a greenie is turning the deserts green <laughs> with nuclear power desalination. That's being a real greenie. You like green, don't you? <laughs> so go nuclear. Why? Because it's natural. <laughs> Next slide. 99.9% .9 of all physical matter in the universe is radioactive. It's nuclear. <laughs> the sun is one big nuclear reactor. It's a fusion reactor. It's big. <laughs> right? You get these greenies to, oh, no, 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 solar energy. Okay, that's solar energy. No, but it's, but it's far away. <laughs> right? It's safe if it's far away. No, we need it here. We need to create our own suns. And that's, if you look at the next slide, this is why. Solar energy. <clears throat> You use science. New concept for some people. There is a metho method to understanding how the universe works. You take the concept of energy flux density and do a comparative study of energy produced by a certain source and its cost benefits or lack of thereof. What that means is energy that is transferred through any given surface. Uh, and so you do a comparison of this per square meter you know, of space on whatever energy source you're talking about. And you can figure out what your flux density is for that particular energy source. Solar energy. We're, talk we're not talking about 
developing new technology. We're talking about 100% availability of that source of energy. Solar energy. You can do the math. How many zeros until you get to that two? Point zero 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 two compared to fossil fuels. This, this is what makes solar energy a joke. It's labor intensive. You know, they have a plant up there. It's an Israeli uh, plant up near uh, in the Mojave Desert near Boron that's doing solar. It's ridiculous. Compare it. There's, there is no comparison to even fossil fuels. Compare, compare that to fission power, which is five to, what, four times? Four hundred times? How many? What's the, who's good at math? A thousand times. Right. Do it. I mean, it's we. So that's we're talking about existing fission nuclear plants. There is absolutely no comparison. If you look at the cost, the price for building solar or fossil fuels, and then the capital investment involved and the recovery time to actually pay off those costs, eight years on a solar reactor. You know, to make your uh, uh, sixty watt light bulb go on or three years for conventional. This is 1980, of course. Four years for fission. When we're talking about fusion power, the power of the sun, we're talking about a not only a, a, a leap in, not simply the actual heat energy. We're not, when we're talking about fission, we're talking about any of these sources of energy, we're talking about heating up some kind of steel plate to boil water that will create steam and run a turbine to do whatever you want to do with it, pump water or make electricity. So you're boiling water. When you're talking about fission, you're talking about actually having the capacity in second and third generation fusion machines to extract the electrons right out of the process itself. You're not boiling water. Right? The energy production goes right into the grid, electrical production. And the byproducts of this revolutionary technology will give you the capacity to completely revolutionize the idea of limited, so-called limited resources or resources generally. Fusion torch. These were studies done in the 70s at the uh, Energy Re Research Power Institute in Northern California. Put anything into a fusion reactor, it breaks it down to its constituent atomic parts. And we already have the technology to filter all those out magnetically. It's a perfect machine for recycling. Talk about 100% recycling capacity, <laughs> right? You can put dirt into this thing and extract everything that's in the dirt, particularly aluminum, gold. It's a good conductor. Silver is even better. So this, this is the kind of uh, potential that we have that will revolutionize the chemical industry, <coughs> not just power generation. It will completely <laughs> redefine our resource capability and transportation capability, particularly for intersolar system and beyond power generation. We've got to go with fusion. That's the way to go. We cut down our space, our travel time to Mars to a couple weeks. That is what the future holds. Now, immediately what we need in terms of nuclear energy, as LaRouche has been stressing over the last couple weeks, particularly in light of the situation in Mexico, we used to have an idea called Mexplex. These are adapting it for Mexico, particularly for water transportation, but also for energy. This was the Nuplex idea, which you build a nuclear reactor, and around which you can have an array of, of other industries, like desalination and so forth. You build a whole complex. This is the kind of integration of industry, agriculture, and energy um, <coughs> that is needed, that we could do. You look at the contrast today. <clears throat> we talked about Governor Downey, which the town of Downey, where he lived, is named for. Well, that's the same piece of real estate that Rockwell was located at that built the, uh, the 1960s. They had 35,000 people working on this facility that built the, the craft that landed man on the moon through the Kennedy Space Program. They built the Apollo Command and Service Modules. They built the Space Shuttle. Now it's an empty lot. Kaiser's thinking about building some kind of bureaucratic 
uh, building there, last I heard. So we have a certain extraterrestrial imperative. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that everything we do in solving the desert problem on this planet and making desert an obsolete word might be used for describing the mind of some backward thinking person, but not a physical phenomena. This is the, the big potato. This is the big one, Mars. <laughs> this, is, this, is the, the, this is all warm up to get here and transform this desert into a garden. And that's going to be a fun job. Go to the next slide, which have already been there. The projects for getting there, the transportation for setting up the, the uh, greenhouses, the other facilities for mining, and terraforming an entire planet, not just uh, a continent or a piece of a continent, but an entire planet to terraform it. You go to the next slide. One of those inhabitants coming from Earth may not be a human being. It may be a jelly plant. Through the cognitive powers of the human mind, there has been work done in, in uh, Florida that has put together genetically a uh, part of a mustard plant and a, a uh, jelly plant that is um, photoreactive. So they've created an organism that responds to the, uh, the lack of oxygen, certain chemicals, and so forth. Sending this to Mars, which they plan to do shortly, and it will give us an accurate reading on the kind of oxygen levels, chemicals, things in the in the soil, and so forth that can be picked up electronically uh, from the uh, the craft that it's up there in and uh, sent back to the Earth. So jelly plants on Mars, man's mom. Next slide, and Larouche wrote this back in. Uh, I think it was 1978, uh, building cities on Mars, designing cities, how to do it, this nuplex idea, as part of Kraft Erika in particular's idea of uh, terraforming uh, the moon and then Mars. The next two slides, and they'll finish here, is this is a composite picture that NASA put together of the world at night. It took them a while to do that. Of course, it's not night all the time in one reality. Uh, so you can see the outline of where the highest concentration of light is. If you go to the next slide, sort of a, a uh, this gives you a corollary, I think, of the uh, population density as well because there's a correspondence between the, the technology developed and usage and the population density. That's where you see it here. You see it in, in northern, north, uh, western Europe in particular. There's nothing here. Of course, there's nothing here, but this is and here. Or here. <laughs> right? So we have to change that so it all looks black or it all looks light at night. That's, that's our uh, objective. That's what we have to do. This is not a, just a nice idea. Nuclear energy is not just another possible idea out of a mix of something, maybe. It's got to be done. There is no other solution. Ta when somebody says, oh, we don't need nuclear power, ask them, how many people live in this state? How many people live just in this country, which is an advanced country, let alone an underdeveloped nation, and say, well, how, ma how much energy does, does 40 million people need? How much energy? How much water do they need? Do you know? Do you know? So if you don't know, why are you saying these stupid things? Because if you don't develop these technology, you will guarantee that people will die. They're already dying. And I went through some of the brief statistics at the beginning of this thing. Every day. That's the real world. It's not what comes on the news. That's the real world. Now we have an opportunity. We can change it in the next months right here in good old California. Take on the tradition that built this state. The Democrats who kicked these Confederate bastards out of the state and kept us in the Union, the people who built the project, who built this city, right? who built the water projects with FDR, 
and the other infrastructure. Pat Brown, that's the real tradition, not Pat Brown's baby boomer son, <laughs> Governor Moonbeam. No, but maybe even he'll change. Right? I mean, he should take after his father, at least on this issue. You know, that's the potential we, not only do we have, we have to do it. Anyway, that's, that's what I have to say. Any questions? Well, I can tell you what we knew 30 years ago. 30 years ago, we were closer to getting fusion, workable fusion reactor than we were when they started the Manhattan Project and getting the atomic bomb. So it's, it, what has happened is the fusion research centers have been basically starved to death, like the Princeton facility and other facilities. There's been efforts to keep it alive in Europe, the European Jet Project with Japan and and some, some uh, factions in the United States, of course. But it's like nuclear energy. What killed nuclear power development in the United States? It wasn't Jane Fonda and the Greenies. <laughs> it wasn't. The Hollywood School of Nuclear Physics did not destroy the nuclear industry in, 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 in the world or in the nation. It was Paul Volcker of the Federal Reserve and interest rates that were double digit that made it impossible to continue any kind of long-term capital investment, whether it was a nuclear plant or any factory or anything. That's what killed the Whoops Project in, in, in Washington State and every other nuclear project. It wasn't that we didn't have, you know, nuclear waste facilities. This is nonsense. It was economics, plain and simple. Usury is stealing. That's why it's a sin. That's why it's in the Bible. And that's because it kills people. And when you shut down these projects, you kill people. And that's how nuclear energy got destroyed. It had nothing to do with the politics of arguments of the so-called green movement, which is being financed by the same bloody bankers. Because their, their concern is not energy. Their not concern is not just making money from producing more oil or power. The way they make money is stealing it, the old-fashioned way. No, no, that, it just gives you an idea of the comparison of the different energy sources. And there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of potential for, I mean, that's what we've got to be doing, producing hydrogen, just like we need to produce water. We have to get away from oil, petroleum. It's too valuable to be burning up in cars anywhere. <laughs> if we're going to use it, there's much more useful things to use it for. You know, it's really, it's really... Uh, It's, that's something you can't really um, measure. You can make certain forecasts. You can take certain things into account. But this is, this is what happened during the World War II mobilization. When they put a certain amount of effort, energy, manpower into certain projects, whether it was building B-17s or, or what have you. And, they, and these accountants and economists would do these statistical runs and trying to figure out what the productivity would be. And they were flabbergasted when they found out that the productivity was 100, 200, 300 percent more than what they had accounted for. They, it was off the charts. You know, when you start launching a Liberty ship every day, you know, from a facility in, in Vancouver, Washington or in Long Beach. Not only that, technologies you hadn't even contemplated occur as a result of these kind of crash efforts. The development of, of nuclear energy being the most uh, well-known, but you know, frozen vegetables, uh, penicillin, radar. You know, you have all these technologies that are spin-off efforts of that war effort, right? Not that you want to produce a tank, but what you had to do is you had to, act, had to get the physical 
economy going first in order to be able to build a tank or an airplane, right? So you had to uh, solve certain physical principles, problems, right? Whether it's aerodynamics or production, what have you. And uh, that's how we came through, uh, made a lot of breakthroughs in, in uh, technology, just because of that brute force effort. A lot of which have never really been fully actualized. Not really. I mean, I'm sure there are a few people here and there. I mean, the space program is like, uh, you know, it's it's like a wounded animal. You know, it's just <laughs> sort of just limping along, trying to survive and trying to get a little nourishment out of this stream or this dead rat or something that's thrown for them to keep alive. A lot of the people who were in NASA, that's one of the big crimes. All these teams were broken up in the late 60s and 70s. That's a crucial part of how you make these kind of breakthroughs. You have these kinds of teams work together. So you had JPL, you know, they're going down to Rite Aid to buy parts to put on, you know, the, the Martian rover. I mean, this is crazy. Right? So you have a handful of really dedicated people, you know, and that's, it's still ticking too, you know. It's, but this is crazy. I mean, this is, what you've done is you've truncated these programs so they're not actually going to achieve what they were set out to achieve in the first place. Right? They're just being, they're limping along. Right? And, I mean, they're, they're doing some useful things, but, you know, sending Mar probes to Mars is pretty much useless unless they're a prelude to sending people. <laughs> I mean, what's the point? I mean, that's why we've got to take more responsibility for the solar system. I'm serious. I really do. Yeah, the, the green thing that I can't remember the name of it, but now that that's that it's gonna be sent to Mars. Like when when it when they plan to do that again? What what? Yeah, you know, like more. I don't know. They were thinking about doing something next year, the year after. I'm not sure where that stands now. But they have some stuff on the NASA website you can check out. So that's just a test. Yeah, it's a, it's 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 an interesting thing because they're doing actually biological research and genetic engineering to come up with something for extraterrestrial exploration. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Uh, I saw this demarcation line between Mexico and the United States for mm -hmm. the water management. Um, I'm wondering, is there any cooperation going on between Mexico and the United States in uh, water, electricity, power, something like that? Nothing that's adequate at all. Nothing that's adequate. See, what what was proposed in the 60s, Nuapa, that's a real project that would provide water to Mexico, not enough water. You also need in Mexico, I mean, we've and we've published this in the past, and studies have been done by by, uh, by Mex people in Mexico, the need to get desalination and water to be pumped into the Central Valley of Mexico over the mountains. So you have a, you actually have the the need for a, a nested uh, series of development projects, for instance, for Mexico, that would involve the United States and Canada, right? Because the water has to go through Canada. <laughs> from Alaska, right? And I'm sure the Canadians can, can be convinced to uh, join in that effort without too much problem. So that's the kind of effort that's needed because, I, I mean, it goes back to the old adage that George Washington, you want a strong nation, have a strong economy, right? The way that you build neighbors and build alliances is through actual mutual beneficial beneficial development projects that are going to benefit the nations involved. Not just trying to be clever on how to steal, you know, from some other nation or people. I mean, that's, that's, that's what all these economic schools teach today. That's what goes on. How to be clever about hoodwinking somebody. Not, a, not about producing something new, production. That's, that's old school, right? No. I mean, it's, it's becoming more increasingly foreign to Americans that the economy comes from building something, 
Right? We see the last vestiges of it in the fight over the auto industry. Right? But we used to have auto plants in Los Angeles at one time. We used to have a steel plant in Los Angeles, a couple of them. We don't have them anymore. Right? They've disappeared. Even the aerospace has disappeared. So what do you have? You have the need for a LaRouche youth movement that's going to change the Democratic Party in this state, change the country. That's what you have. Right? You have to build a future. I mean, there's just so much work to be done. It's, it's just uh, amazing. And I, you know, it's, it's more fun than uh, watching videos. <laughs> as long as the electricity stays up too. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, when you look at Mars and compare it to the Earth, there's not a lot of water uh, on the surface of Mars. How do you actually go about um, creating a, an atmosphere on Mars there's, if you don't have water? There's a couple different ideas. Actually, some people think that the there might be frozen water on the caps of the poles. Mm -hmm. That's one way of doing it. Terraforming means you know big fusion reactors. There's other ideas of actually diverting uh, ice asteroids into Mars, things Why of that not? nature. <laughs> What's that? Have them crash onto the surface? Yeah, yeah, in such a manner that it's not going to destroy the planet. But this is this is one of the ideas of these Whoa. these NASA terraforming groups. Well, well, you, it's not like you're going to hurt anybody down there. <laughs> That's one idea. But you know that's 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 on the drawing boards. We don't even. You know, that's, we have to we have to know more about what's there first. Sure, I mean, there could be water beneath the surface. Could very well be. Yeah. It'd be better than bringing bottled water. That's for sure. There, it seems to be that there was evidence that there was water there. So there still may be some there now. They said there was water beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. Certainly possible. So, is that it? Okay. So, if you're interested.